Hello and welcome. This is the newsroom for today, Monday, November 30th, 2020. We're broadcasting to you on E1, Scar TV, NTN, and Tarsi TV in Barticum. In the headlines, new COVID-19 measures allow for restart of Guyana Suriname ferry service, the reopening of interior lodges and resorts, and a lockdown of Region 7 to essential services only. A Burby's mother loses a second son to an accident. I'm going to send it to you to now. I'm going to lose my son by an accident and nearly lose me life. A housing construction boom can help revive LATAM. And in sport, national sports policy currently under review, says Ramson Jr. and Regal Speedboat and Fisherman Masters Excel at Prime Minister's softball tournament. With the news, I'm Neil Marks. We're glad you could join us. After months of closure due to COVID-19, the ferry service between Guyana and Suriname will resume on December 12th. This was revealed in an updated COVID-19 gasseted order published on Monday. The authorities in Region 6 since the beginning of the pandemic in March were faced with an illegal border crossing between Guyana and Suriname. Without the ferry service, the alternative is using the backtrack route to illegally enter and leave Guyana. But a recent announcement by the presidents of Suriname and Guyana to provide a temporary solution to resume the ferry service was welcomed by both countries. The MV Kanawaima, the main vessel, is down for repairs, and so both countries will have to decide on which ferry will be used in the meantime. Now, the local tourism industry has been allowed to reopen interior lodges and resorts under the new gasseted COVID-19 measures released on Monday. Hotels, interior lodges and resorts and tour companies are now allowed to operate 24-7 as tourism is now listed under essential services. But their operation will have to be in accordance with COVID-19 health guidelines as approved by the Guyana Tourism Authority. The 10.30 p.m. to 4 a.m. curfew remains in effect from December 1st to the 31st. Days before this announcement, President of the Tourism and Hospitality Association of Guyana, Mitchell Ramkumar, had called on the government to give the sector a chance to breed. All resorts, hotels and other tourist attractions will, be, will only be allowed to operate on the strict COVID-19 guidelines issued by the Guyana Tourism Authority in order to minimize the risk and spread of the coronavirus when hosting clients, the order states. Further, operators of any service will be responsible for ensuring that their staff and clients comply with the guidelines. The Guyana Tourism Authority will be responsible for enforcing and implementing the guidelines. And if anyone fails to comply, the Minister of Health may close the operation of that business or prohibit any activity. Hundreds employed with the sector have either lost jobs or were laid off due to the pandemic. The tourism industry around the world is one of the har hardest hit due to the pandemic. The government has imposed a travel restriction for Kayuni Mazaruni, that's Region 7, to prevent a further spread of COVID-19. The region, as of Monday, recorded a total of 471 cases, of which 71 are active. However, 66 of the active cases are in Bartica, the COVID-19 hotspot in the region. The new gasseted COVID-19 measures released on Monday states that non-essential travel into or out of Region 7 is restricted until the end of the year, and travel shall only be permitted where it is connected to an essential service. There shall be gatherings of no more than five persons, and the six feet physical distance between persons must also be applied. The Regional Democratic Council will be responsible for ensuring that government buildings, landings, and means of transportation and conveyances are sanitized. It was further stated that the Ministry of Health may test any person for COVID-19 and quarantine and isolate them. Meanwhile, the Joint Services will be responsible for securing isolation and quarantine sites, materials, materials and goods for those sites, and they will also have a responsibility for the security of screening and testing checkpoints, provide escort for mobile teams, and ensure the security of entry and exit points, including the landings. The Minister may, after an assessment of the situation in Region 7, impose any other measure to prevent the spread of the COVID-19 pandemic. Meanwhile, 30 persons were tested positive for COVID-19 in the past 24 hours, pushing the monthly total to 1,243. This is according to the Ministry of Health's daily dashboard, which currently records 
5,406 COVID-19 cases in the country. Monday's new cases were recorded as follows. Two in Region 2, four in Region 3, two in Region 4, 16 in Region 6, five in Region 7, and one in Region 10. There are currently three persons in the COVID-19 intensive care unit at the Infectious Diseases Hospital. According to the daily COVID-19 dashboard, there are 797 persons on home isolation and 63 persons in institutional isolation. There are 31 suspected cases in institutional quarantine. The ministry reported that so far there have been 151 deaths and 4,392 recoveries. Now, as we mentioned just now, the three remaining COVID-19 patients who were being treated at the intensive care unit of the Georgetown Hospital have been transferred to the Infectious Disease Hospital at Lilliendal on Friday last. The patients were transferred successfully one at a time using an ambulance set up to replicate treatment for critical COVID-19 patients. For the past eight months, critically ill patients were treated at the Georgetown Public Hospital, which only had a limited capacity. Minister of Health Dr. Frank Anthony in Monday's COVID-19 update said up to 29 critically ill patients can be treated at the facility. As of Monday, a total of 17 patients were actually being treated. I've started using that facility for some time now, and the persons who we had there were more, mostly mild patients. Uh, however, th those persons would have required some form of um, isolation and we have been using the facility in, in that way. But as of uh, Friday, uh, what we have been able to do is transfer all the ICU patients that we have at GPHC over to uh, the Ocean View facility. Uh, we have the capacity there that is much larger than GPHC because GPHC was catering for about 15 patients. At Ocean View now we have capacity for 15 uh, for 25 patients mm -hmm. with uh, an additional four um, in another area. So technically we can have at least 29 patients who are um, severely ill and we, we, we would be able to comfortably manage them at Ocean View. It took us a while to get the ICU up and running but all the things that are necessary for, uh, for an ICU are now in place and we currently have at Ocean View now in our um, infectious disease ICU there uh, 14 patients. Minister of Health Dr. Frank Anthony there will have more news after the break. You're watching the newsroom. A 26-year-old sluice operator of number 11 village East Burbies Quarantine died at the Georgetown Public Hospital early Monday, 24 hours after he was struck down by a motor van on the Bramfield Public Road East Burbies Quarantine. The man has been identified as Ganesh Ramlakan. He was on his way to work when he was knocked off his bicycle. Police reported that the motor van was proceeding east along the northern carriageway when it is alleged by the driver that Ramlakan, who was proceeding in the opposite direction, swerved into the path of his vehicle. The driver said he attempted to swerve to avoid a collision, but the right side rearview mirror came into contact with Ramlakan's left arm. As a result, he fell onto the road and received injuries about his body. He was transferred to the Georgetown Public Hospital, where he died early Monday. Ramakan's mother, Sharmila, said this is the second son she has lost in an accident. Another son was killed back in March 2016 when they were both struck down by a drunken driver. He brought a day in an accident? When? Uh -huh. 2017 January. Where? Mm. Right down there. Mm. And then 2017 March, he fell in an accident again. Mm. So at number 19. And now the second one. Mm. So, mm. I don't lose him. He's the Amrang Amma. My son is bad and get a little way for that, especially when it's really kid like misbehaving especially when they're home but um when it's sober it's very good you know when when they're home like nobody know if he was home unless if he drank and come home then everybody hit him out but it's 
Good to meet you when you see so. Well, I don't know, but Allah are here inside your whole body. What's that mean? I guess. 15-year-old Trevon Atkins, a student of Wisberg Secondary School who died at Linden's Blue Lake, could not swim. His former guardian, Andrew Lacon, has told the newsroom. Atkins went underwater on Saturday at about 5.30 in the afternoon when he went to the lake with his 17-year-old sister and four other relatives. Relatives, along with assistance from the Ghana Police Force, searched throughout the night into Sunday until his body was found about 11 in the morning. I was not there when it happened, but I was told because he had the same sister that went to swim, used to live with me. So um, they just go in, they see they go, the mother, you moved to the same area and they went away with the mother. So I was told, I got the call night before last and say he was, he, he drowned at the Blue Lake, right? Um, his sister and some other, I think of four others, they went to swim and she claimed that she, you know, she went on top of him, she went on his back in the water, and after he started to panic, she, she rolled him around the neck, like choking, and she started to go down to, so they managed to save, call, and by the time they go to his rescue, he was already gone. Now we went to this, we went to this lake yesterday and get him out of the water after like, a uh, little, um, like four or five hours search, they get him around 10, um, take him to the waste basket or complex where they pronounce him bad. The mother's like, she, the mother really can't deal with it now, you know, she ain't saying much, she ain't talking to nobody, thinking the sister the same thing. Not related to him, but it was like a two minutes walk away from me, the mother lived, but he had nine children, she had nine children, less eight now that he died. He moved away in March. Okay. To go back to yeah, his mother? But, yeah, because I think that pregnant and the stepfather was ailing. So the mother asked me to let him go to a fist and you know, I still got clothes. He, he was with me anymore. He go by me, he come and take, and he said she left him out. How could Trevor last? I think Thursday, yeah, Thursday. Because he came at me, he was eating and thing, and we were talking, and he gave me some rundown in the house with, you know. He was going to a lot. The government is pushing ahead with its plans for the development of lands for housing, not only on the coast, but in the interior regions as well. A case in point is Latham in Region 9. For Minister of Housing and Water, Colin Kroll, this is not just about fulfilling the housing needs of persons. He is aware of the spin-off effects, such as the jobs that can be created in the construction sector and the flurry of activities which could drive businesses in the town, which has been battered by the COVID-19 pandemic. This is Latham in Region 9. Owing to cross-border trade and travel, this is usually a bustling town. But like everywhere else, COVID-19 has slowed things down. There is just one day identified for limited cross-border activity. In this area, which serves as the central administrative district and economic hub of Region 9, there is also need for land to meet the growing housing need. In here for Latham and Region 9 uh, Central, um, there are about 560 applicants, active applicants, who are waiting in the system. Colin Kroll, the Minister of Housing and Water, travelled to Latham on Saturday. Here, at this meeting at the Amerindian Hostel, he met with residents of the town and other areas in Region 9 to address their needs. For some of those already allocated lands, their dream of getting a land title was realised. I already move in, I already build and move in already. I was just waiting on the title. The wait is over and I'm very happy with the government for providing me with this title. For the meeting, Minister Kroll walked along with the top officials of his ministry dealing with housing, including Permanent Secretary Andrew Ali and former banker and now head of the Central Housing and Planning Authority, Sherwin Greaves, who early laid out the purpose of the meeting. Our commitment to not only resolving the issues that um, are occurring in this area, but to ensure that going forward they don't happen again and that we can find new lands and open new areas for more housing. Yes, that's the plan, to find more lands that can be used to fill the growing housing need in and around Latham. The minister also walked with a team to push that work forward. We, uh, we have done housing program here and this here in Region 9 can say this is a testimony legacy of the People's Progressive Party Civic and we have six areas that we have done housing program here and so we needed to 
we need to continue that program, and that is why the team are they are out, the Soviet team it's out, they are out to ensure that we do the necessary preparatory work for the land area to be identified for future allocations. Preparing land for housing in Latam itself is much cheaper than it would cost on the coast. Where we are identifying now, um, um, it is more land clearing, and in Latam will be will cost less, and um, because some of the lands we have on the coast will more more of, of sugar cane, and so the soil type will be soft, and so there's a lot of um, <coughs> base work has, that has to be done. Well, here the, the soil type is much more for where we're looking at uh, is more compact and in some areas rock. At least two areas have so far been identified for housing development and once all issues can be sorted, the plans will go ahead. Apart from identifying the space and developing the land, there is also a focus on ensuring that there will be access to water and electricity. Most of the lands will be allocated to those classified as low-income earners and rather than build houses, the priority for the housing ministry will be on handing out lots so families can choose what kind of house they want to build on it. We want to ensure um, that we provide the opportunity for especially our young people to go on to own their own home to ensure that they, they, they will be able to start their family in a different environment and so we want to help push the economy here because housing housing construction the construction industry in general and housing drive also pushes the economy there's a lot of spin off from from that and that of course everyone benefits if when you're building or constructing and so we we want to ensure that is done and so we want to make when you come here you you it will be like a region 9 scenario um, the type of houses and that kind of thing but um, you you'll feel you'll feel very much that you have a developed place more news ahead, stay with us. You're watching the newsroom. CCTV cameras have captured the moment a group of armed bandits on the night pounced on former murder accused Marcus Bisram and his family at number 71 Village Currently in Burbies. According to reports, the men carted off millions in cash from the premises. The incident occurred just after sundown Sunday. Bisram, a wealthy philanthropist, was constantly in the news after he was accused of ordering the murder of Burbies carpenter Fayaz Narindat four years ago but was this year freed. He spoke with the newsroom about Sunday night's attack.
we were conversating right here where we're sitting at. Um, it's all relatives, cousins and aunts and uncles. And four mass uh, men came in and t t three of them had a um, gun and one of them had a, a machete, a cutlass. And they just um, came in and says, um, don't move. And they relieve every one of their cell phones first. And um, then they direct us to go into the house, um, all of us. And then they relieve everyone there of their jewelry. And um, one of them took me to my room. He asked me where is my room. And um, I show him and he took me to my room and um, asked me for all the jewelry and money, which um, I give to him uh, because he had a gun at, at, at a two-year-old kid at his head um, following me around as well. Two of them was following me and the other two um, was with the, the rest of the um, relatives who was here, which was about like 15 of us was here. It's our um, usual routine, you know, our, all of our cousins, they come over and we um, hang out and conversate in the evening time. I cannot, um, I don't want to exaggerate because I don't know the amount of jewelry they um, took away from the other people, but I could speak for myself only. Um, they took away um, two 100 penny weight bangle each, one 100 penny weight each, and a 100 penny weight um, gold chain. A uh, diamond ring of 12,000 US dollar, um, 5 million um, Guyana dollar cash, and um, my wallet with approximately seven credit cards and 2,000 US dollar um, inside of it. And you usually keep all this money at home or you had it for a reason? I had it for a reason. Um, it was a turning fees that I had to pay. Did you, did you, um, did you recently take the money out or have it at home here? Or? Yes. Um, no. $185 million in contracts have been signed to repair the four main roads in the Tushan New Scheme, East Bank as a gribble. For the roadworks in Tushan, several contractors have been hired so that the project will be completed in a timely manner. Actually, uh, when we took government uh, um, August 2nd, um, what we did, the first thing that we did is um, a conditional survey of some of the roads in the country. Um, some of the worst ones that we are trying to tackle first that are affecting most of the population. So in Tushin here, um, in this area, registered voters alone between this NDC is about 25,000 people, right? Between the Tushin, Zilot, NDC. And uh, that's a lot of people, right? So four of the main roads in here that stretches from the front of the main access road straight into the scheme, um, running from, uh, that will be north to south. Um, there are four main roads, right? And here you have the medical center right behind me. So imagine you're sick, you're getting a stroke or you're getting a heart attack and you got to come through this. By the time you reach to there or something, it, it gets worse. So what we are doing here, we are, we are rehabilitating these roads. All of the areas that are damaged, we are taking them out. We are going to lay back the, bed, the bedrock. We're going to do the compacting and then we're going to put back the asphaltic concrete on it, right? So the, the bitumen. So we are doing those four roads from the start to the end, right, in phase one. But in Tushin alone, we have over 3,000 households that live in here. In phase one, we have over 2,500 households, all right? Now, this will go a far way in giving access to the residents, to all the facilities and amenities that exist within the Tushin housing scheme. The roads, the, the main access road in this area has been in a terrible state. We've received many complaints from residents uh, for of the basically complaining of the poor accessibility. Uh, a lot of persons have complained that their vehicles have been damaged because of the the state of these roads. Additionally to this, uh, we as I am here, as we are here, we are standing in the Hill Center Street. We've received a lot of complaints from patients um, with difficulty to access the Hill Center. Sometimes they have patients here who need. Um, secondary medical attention and it, it is very difficult to let's say get an ambulance in here or even get a car out from here to access the main hospital so yes uh, I am really grateful as, as we can see our government continue to deliver as was committed Arguments on whether the petition filed by Attorney General Anil Nandlal to strike out the second elections petition of the APNU plus AFC continued on Monday before Chief Justice Roxon George. Nandlal argued that the petition was not properly served on former President David Granger. 
Senior Counsel Douglas Mendez, who represents President Irfan Ali and Vice President Barra Jagdil, also argued that the petition in itself is not serving the interests of the coalition since it will unseat the current opposition parliamentarians and incur costs to the party to contest another election. The matter has to be concluded for the court to move ahead with the petitions and the case was adjourned to Tuesday at 9.30 in the morning. Former Attorney General Basil Williams, who is representing former President Granger, said he awaits the court's decision to move forward. That those persons on the on the list represented by the second respondent who were um, declared elected to the National Assembly, their um, election will be declared null and void, uh, and then they will now have to incur the expense of, of, of contesting another election, because if the election is declared void in accordance with that relief, then there will have to be another election. So that is clearly not in accordance with, or, or that conflicts with their interests, um, the interests of, of the members on that list. The list AP and UAFC garnered the second largest block of votes at elections. The, a member of that list is currently the leader of the opposition in the National Assembly. How can a petition be heard and that list will not be heard? And that list that, that, that petition can nullify all the seats gained by that political party and revoke the status of leader of the opposition. That political party constitutes the, largest, the second largest block of seats in the, in the National Assembly. So, Your Honor, in, in conclusion, I wish to reiterate respectfully that the petition, at least um, the one we are complaining about, should be dismissed on this ground, non-service and or defective service on the two respondents. I'll be, I'll, I suppose the most I could say will be guided by what comes out from the arguments of the petitioners. But we have served. The law uh, permits us to serve, to say we have no intention of opposing. And, um, you know, we'll abide by that. I think you're skirting the question, Mr. Williams. The direct question is whether a person who is not a proper party can file a notice of intention not to oppose the petition. But you all know where we are now. We are before you. We have submitted to your jurisdiction. Arguments have now subsequently exposed facto to our subjects submitted to your jurisdiction. Have been have arisen as to whether uh, what is our status. We didn't join ourselves. We were brought to the court. We didn't stay away from the service, corporate service on us. So we here, the court will determine what's our status. When the newsroom returns, the financial weather and bridge reports along with sport. Back here watching the newsroom and it's time for sport. The National Sports Policy is currently under review, says Minister of Culture, Youth and Sport Charles Ramson Jr. Giving an update on progress with the document at the weekend, the minister highlighted that a consultation process is on the way to help chart a way forward. The, the sports policy now is currently being reviewed. It's going through a um, very serious uh, process of consultation. Um, I am I'm also personally looking at uh, the sports policy to see that it reflects the, the mission and the direction of the ministry. In addition to that, once that's done and we amend the sports policy to reflect uh, that direction, then we are going to uh, share it with the associations once again have a working session with them as because we're going to be having some um, of our monthly sessions with them starting on Monday 
Um, when we start doing that, we are going to be able to tailor and make all the kinds of modifications of the sports policy that uh, is sensible it, it, as part of the consultation process. That then goes up to the cabinet subcommittee and then it goes up to the cabinet for it to be laid over in, in Parliament um, at the appropriate time. And here's the rest of the sport news with Avinash Ramzan. I'm Neil Marks. Take care. We tell you now that the third and final T20 International of West Indies Tour of New Zealand was called off after just 14 balls due to heavy rain. West Indies were asked to bat first and reached 25 for one of 2.2 overs on Monday. Brandon King hit a four and a six but fell for 11 of seven balls. At the break, Andre Fletcher was not out on four and Kyle Mears unbeaten on five in his second innings at this level. New Zealand won the series 2-0 following their wins by five wickets in the first match at Eden Park on Friday night and by 72 runs in the second contest at the Bay Oval on Sunday afternoon. The two teams will now travel to Hamilton for the first test match at Seddon Park starting on Wednesday at 6 p.m. Caribbean time. Over 50 team Regal Legends won their second consecutive Prime Minister's softball T20 title. Ariel Speedboat won their third All-Stars title out of four tournaments. And Fisherman Masters got their first at the Everest Cricket Club ground on Sunday. Akim Green reports. Chasing 127 for victory, Regal Legends strolled to the target in 16.5 overs, complements of a solid 5-1 from a his Chunilal who struck three maximums and four fours. He was backed up by an unbeaten 27 from Ralph Baker. Simangal Yadram was the pick of the bowlers for Savage Legends, whose 125 for 6 was built on a dearest 31. Eric Thomas took 2 for 11 for Regal and had good support from Panish Prasad 2 for 14 and Mahenj Hardial 2 for 28. Thomas won a 55 inch 4K smart television for his man of the series exploits. He took 5 wickets and made 255 runs, inclusive of 2 centuries. Hardy Al was also the captain, told Newsroom Sport after the game he was pleased with his side's continued success since the over 50 category was introduced. We, we were making this a habit, you know. Um, of course, um, me, me and my very good friend from um, New York was talking yesterday, looking at. Um, the over 50 category, he said when he comes into this category, he probably thought it would have been easy, but it's, it's so competitive. And, and you know, um, year go, year come, um, the standard of softball in the over uh, 50 category is upping. The players that we have, um, you know, we, we don't chop and change. It's one set of players. So when you look at the categories like four to five, some of them will go over to 50. So, you know, the team uh, continue to, to strengthen and everything else. The over 4 out of 5 final between Fisherman Masters and Wellman Masters proved to be one of the most thrilling for today, as over 470 runs were scored in the match. Brutal hitting from Keith Fraser, in which he made 178 not out, powered Fisherman to an imposing 240 for 4. The left-hander plummel 15 massive sixes, some reaching Curry First Avenue, and the same amount in fours. The magnitude of Fraser's innings was that the next best score was 10 from Ramo Malone. In response, Wellman ended in 237 for four, despite 108 from Greg DeFrancia and 87 from Troy Lewis. It's a very good feeling because this our, we have went to several finals and we always lost. This is our first major final that we have won. And we're very ecstatic about winning this final. All, and I think it was one of the best final played. Most people have enjoyed it. It was very close. And I'm sure that it is worth a while for to be here. The All-Stars final between defending champions Regal and former champion Speedboat was expected to be a belter given the quality and experience of both sides. But it ended up being a bit one-sided. Regal initially kept the arch rivals in check at 109 for 5 at the end of the 15th over, until Amir Yusuf produced a squash buckling performance in which he got them 68 of the last 4 overs to an eventual total of 201 for 6. Yusuf made an unbeaten 5th one, hitting 1-4 one and 7 sixes from just 13 balls in a 79 run partnership with Safras Karim, who battled early accuracy of Regal to come out unbeaten on 7-1, striking 1-4 and 5 sixes. In the chase, Regal were on par with 28 without loss in 2.1 overs until rain forced a break in play. That break proved to be the charm for Speedboat who came back rocking back with quick wickets and tight bowling. 
Richard missed the cricket Latif struck 1-6 in his 9, while fellow opener Fazal Rafik made 25. Delroy Pereira top scored for Regal with a 34 ball 47 hitting 3 fours and 4 sixes. And got support from Avinash Mohabir 22 not out and Ricky Sargent 21. But the runs came much too slow given the required rate. Ian Ivan took 2 for 29 and Kishore Smith 2 for 30, which limited Regal to 170 for 6. Yeah, happy. First man for win three, three Prime Minister Cup in a row. Happy, happy man. Thanks to the Almighty. Thanks to Amir. Thanks to you, Yusuf, Safras Karim. He two of them power great innings, six or something in three over four we and put me in a nice position that we could win the game. Thanks to those guys. For the newsroom, Akim Green. Sport Minister Charles Ramson Jr. said that while a National Sports Commission board will be appointed, no specific time frame has been set for the appointment of those members. Names have been put forward, the minister noted, and those submissions are currently engaging the attention of Cabinet. As it relates to the um, Sports Commission, we had gone through a number of, of variations um, for persons. It's something that the, the, the Cabinet is paying attention to. Um, but we're also monitoring what was it that the Sports Commission board, right, the commission itself, which is the board, what was it that they did over the last five years? And quite frankly, what's been um, a little bit disappointing is what's been a little bit disappointing and also concerning for me as somebody who has to appoint another board is if you've had a board that hasn't done anything, then you've got to get to the bottom of why it hasn't done anything before you start making hurried decisions about what it's going to be done. Because we now, we give this subvention to this quote-unquote commission, um, but it's really the ministry that has to process uh, the, the, a lot of, well, not a lot, but all of their payments, but it's still the body has to be accountable. Having said that, I'm the minister responsible for having the allocation being done which means that I have to be able to account as well for the, the subvention that they receive. And that's why being satisfied that the Sports Commission is functioning the way that it should, one, uh, being satisfied as to the explanations why it is that it did not function the way that it did uh, as the board, and then uh, being able to make the appropriate appointments as the time goes by. However, as you would see, that even in the absence, um, sports has now got the energy, it's got the um, intensity and the, the passion being led by the ministry. First time in a very long time. And we're proud to know that we're doing it this way. We are going to be able to hand over to a sports commission in, in, in not too distant future. Put a, a specific time frame. I can't. I can't put a specific time frame on it. Finally, in sport this evening, prosecutors in Argentina are investigating Diego Maradona's doctor for possible manslaughter following the footballing legend's death five days ago. Police in Buenos Aires have searched the house and private clinic of the doctor as they try to establish if there was negligence in Maradona's treatment following surgery. The 60-year-old died of a heart attack at his home where he's cut. The 60-year-old died of a heart attack at his home where he was recuperating. His daughters have pressed for details about their father's medication. Maradona had a successful operation on a brain blood clot earlier in November and was due to be treated for alcohol dependency. The doctor has stressed that he's cooperating with the authorities and that he had done his best for Maradona until the very end. And with that, we've come to the end of the news for this evening. My name is Abhinash Ramzan. Thanks for watching.